you have written a book, Beyond the Fence Line. It's the eyewitness account of Ed Hoffman. We can give a quick background to it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody listening to the show is familiar with who he is. As a teacher for 40 years, I had the opportunity to take uh, students to Dallas along with Brian for about 35 years. We did an oral history and we brought them to the plaza and we had an opportunity to meet and greet a lot of uh, eyewitnesses. We brought in Ed Hoffman probably about 25 to 30 years ago. And Ed was one of the most spectacular witnesses that we've ever had. And my students, being high school, some college students, had the opportunity to listen to what he had to say. But we had interpreters because Ed tried to talk, couldn't talk. And at the same time, my students were very attentive to listen, and they had tremendous questions to ask him. But his testimony, along with my students and also to the authorities over the years, was really an impeccable type of a situation where I don't think this guy could ever lie about anything. He he was there. He got emotional about it. He walked up and down the fence line saying that this is what he saw take place. And as an eyewitness, he was one of the most believable eyewitnesses that Brian and I have ever seen. And Brian uh, and I have seen and talked to probably about 75 to 80 eyewitnesses over the, the past probably 45 to 50 years. Do you want to just give a brief background of what he saw? Sure. Ed worked at Texas Instruments in North Dallas, and on the morning of the assassination, having a morning break, his habit was to get soft drink with some ice on it. Well, he was while he was chewing the ice, he broke one of his molar teeth, and it was causing severe pain, and, and he asked his supervisor if he could go to his dentist, which was in Grand Prairie on the other side of Dallas. And so he was given permission, and Ed got in his car and was driving from Texas Instruments. And as he got closer to Dealey Plaza, he saw people standing on the sides of the roads with placards and said, welcome, JFK. And that's when he remembered that President Kennedy was coming to town, but had not paid attention to it because he had to work and he wasn't going to be able to go to see the parade or whatever. And so he pulled into Dealey Plaza and thought, well, while I'm away from work, I'll stop and watch the parade. Ed drove down Elm Street and out onto Stemmons Freeway and saw cars parked along the side. He parked along the the breakdown side of the highway and was walking back towards the uh, overpass on Stemmons Freeway. The president's car went down, it went west on Elm Street underneath the triple underpass and then proceeded to get out on the Stemmons. Well, the entrance ramp onto Stemmons, Ed was sitting above that on the side of the road. And, of course, being a deaf person, the the traffic zipping by at 55 or 60 miles an hour didn't bother him. So he had a a bird's eye view, basically, of of the entrance ramp and a unobstructed view to the east of the, the picket fence area in the parking lot and the railroad tower and the west side of the book depository. He said he got to that location about 12 o'clock, and a few minutes after he got there, he noticed a uh, a car driving into the parking lot. Of course, you know, he didn't pay any attention to it except the fact that it looked like it was looking for a parking space, and it drove around and then left. And then a few minutes later, another car came in, drove around, and then left. A whole different car uh, drove around the parking lot, and his by then, Ed's attention was to the area behind the picket fence. And he said he saw a man with a suit coat or a suit and a sports coat and a fedora style hat. Everybody wore hats back. All the men wore hats back in the 60s, I guess. And then he said he saw another man dressed what he assumed was a railroad worker. He had coveralls or overalls of some type standing by one of the railroad switch boxes. And at some point before the president's car showed up, these two men met you know, stood stood close to each other, but obviously at that distance, about 200 yards or so, he couldn't tell what they were saying because he's deaf and he wouldn't be able to hear what they were saying anyway. But he said these two men obviously knew each other and they separated and the man wearing the coveralls or the overalls went and stood back by the railroad switch box and the other man with the suit and the hat went back along the uh, to the area of the picket fence area and basically said he was pacing back and forth for the longest time. And then 
about 1225 or so, a car came into the parking lot, uh, Rambler station wagon, and it parked by the railroad tower. Lee Bowers was working in the railroad tower at that time, and he said that car parked right on the right on the side of that. And he remembered what kind of a car it was because his good friend had one exactly like that. So this man with the suit and the hat, at some point, Ed looked over and he saw the man standing at the fence and he held a rifle, was holding a rifle and pointing it towards Elm Street. Now, Ed's elevation where he was at, he could not see Elm Street, but he could see the picket fence and the parking lot and the railroad tower and the west side of the book depository. But because of the elevation, he couldn't see the car coming down Elm Street. He said he saw a puff of smoke come from where this man in the suit and the hat was standing and assumed that the man was smoking a cigar. And then when the man at the fence turned towards uh, Ed's direction, he said he saw the man holding a rifle across his chest. And the man sprinted down the fence line, stopped suddenly, and tossed the rifle with both hands underhanded to the man who stepped around from the railroad switch box, the man he had seen earlier in the brown outfit or the overalls or the coveralls. He said that man caught it, stepped back to the uh, railroad switch box, bent over and took the weapon apart in two different pieces, one in each hand, put it in a soft type of canvas bag and walked rapidly out of the area towards the uh, railroad tracks. The man who tossed the rifle that Ed saw, thought was smoking a cigar, walked casually back towards the fence line when he was encountered at gunpoint by a uniformed Dallas police officer. He saw the police officer pull his gun out, point it right at the man's chest, and he said the man with the suit coat and this fedora-style hat reached in his coat or his lapel pocket or his pants pocket or something and pulled out at something to show the officer who he was or, or what he was. And the officer put his gun back in his holster and they went their separate directions. Now the limousine and the follow-up car and all the rest of the motorcaders coming up Stemmons Expressway on the entrance ramp. And Ed looked down in the car, said he could see Mrs. Kennedy. He didn't realize who they were until he saw them. But he said that it was Mrs. Kennedy in the, in the pink outfit. She was on her knees, face in the back of the car, on the floorboard. And the president was lying face down in the car, and the back of his head was all gone, basically. And he said there was a man on the back of the car, and that was Clint Hill. And he said the car sped up and took off. So Ed, uh, in an effort to try to, uh, you know, raise the alarm that something was wrong, was running towards his car. And he remembered there was a police officer standing on the railroad overpass of Stimmons Freeway where he parked his car. And he was trying to get this man's attention as he was running. He was waving his arms, trying to get the officer's attention. And he said the next car that came up the ramp was the follow-up car. And one of the agents, he didn't know who they were, but he said one of the people in the back of the car pulled out a rifle and pointed it right at Ed as he was running parallel to the entrance ramp. So Ed said he stopped immediately, which was probably a good thing that he did. And the rest of the motorcade sped up and got on the highway. And Ed got to his car, got on the highway because they had closed off the highway to allow the motorcade to get free access to the road. Ed got in his car, went up Continental Avenue and drove around behind the picket fence trying to find this man. But uh, he never did. And so he went on to his doctor's office, you know, went to the dentist and told the dentist, you know, through sign language or written down form of some kind that, that he'd seen the president had been shot. And according to what he told us, that the dentist had no idea what he was talking about because he was working with patients all morning. And Ed said the dentist stepped out of the office and came back a few minutes later. And apparently he turned on the radio and the, that's all the news was covering was the president had been shot. And Ed said, well, I I already saw that. I was down there. And so the doctor was the first person he had told. After he got through with the dentist, he went to his family-owned floral shop in Grand Prairie. And his dad had wondered, why why are you here? He said, well, I saw the president get shot. And he says, well, don't, you know, let the police handle it and let it go. So basically, Ed was told 
not to tell anybody because it's not it wasn't any of his concern. So that's basically the thumbnail sketch of what Ed saw that day. And unfortunately, only print where Ed Hoffman's name was in was Jim Mars's book Crossfire had mentioned Ed only as maybe three or four paragraphs. And so that's what Casey and I got the idea that someday we would do talk to this guy because apparently he was overlooked. He knew the truth and he said he got so angry when he watched television. And then every time he said they'd show that building, the Texas School Book Depository, or they'd show Lee Harvey Oswald, Ed said he got so mad. He said, well, the building had nothing to do with it. And I don't know who that guy is. That isn't the guy I saw shoot the rifle. So it, it was it was real frustrating to hear his story, but I'm glad we got it on the record. When you dug into his story, we find out that his uncle was a detective in the Dallas police force. And it seemed as if his father and his uncle, they were trying to downplay this. They recognized the gravity of the situation that if he did witness something, he'd be in trouble. Do you, uh, one of you want to just detail a little bit his uncle and um, his role in either they're exposing or kind of keeping quiet the story? Part of that story goes with the idea that his uncle was a police officer and got a hold of the family during Thanksgiving uh, when they came over. And Ed was excited to tell his story to him, and he did. And at the same time, it scared his mother. It scared his family. And Ed was kind of scared at the same time, too. But he felt that he had something important to tell, and he wanted to tell the police. So he told his uncle, and his uncle basically told him that, I think you need to keep quiet on this and then kind of did the same thing with with mom and dad and everybody there that, you know, you need to keep him quiet. What had occurred after that was that when, when people started to talk to Ed and Ed was trying to get his story out, the authorities basically started to ask mother and father and grandmother about who Ed was and if he could be trusted. Well, grandmother and father basically said that Ed is prone to lie a little bit and exaggerate. And so they kind of downplayed the whole thing, which didn't give Ed any credibility at all. And once he found out about that, he kind of shunned them and also uh, his uncle. They lied about the idea that uh, he wasn't credible. But uh, we happened to get a hold of his uncle, and his uncle said he was very credible. He said Ed would never lie. And so he believed him 100% that when he said that he saw somebody behind the picket fence, fire a rifle and then run down the fence line and dump dump the rifle off. So his uncle verified to us that Ed, that he believed Ed 100%, even though his entire family was very leery about the possibility that his life might be in danger. In fact, uh, when I talked to uh, the uncle, he was a uh, a detective in the auto theft unit. And uh, I asked him, I said, were you on duty that day? He says, no, I was off duty. I said, well, did you get called in because of the president's motorcade? He goes, no, it's a typical day off for me. He says, they didn't call me in. They didn't need me. I said, well, did you talk to Ed at Thanksgiving? He says, oh, yeah. He says, we went over there, and he was all excited about telling me something. And, of course, now you got to remember, Ed is a deaf mute. His father is not. So Ed would sign the story to his father, and then the father would tell the uncle verbally. And then, you know, any questions that would come through would have to come through Ed's father and they had to sign it. To, you know, there's always the loss in translation ability or capability. But the bottom line is when I asked him, did Ed tell you the story? Oh, yeah, he told me the whole story. I said, did you believe him? He said, oh, yeah, Eddie would never lie about something like that. I said, did you tell anybody at the police department? He says, no, because we were afraid for Eddie's life. Something would happen to Eddie, so I didn't tell anybody. So Ed's story, fresh from the time, languished in Nowhereville. I mean, it was just out there, and only a few people knew about it. Some people at work, where Ed worked at Texas Instruments, the family knew about it, his wife knew about it, and nobody followed up on it until 19, was it 1967, when uh, one of the uh, Texas worker, his supervisor or friend of his at Texas Instruments said, you need to tell somebody. Because it, this is an important, even though it's five years after, four years after the case, you still need to tell somebody. So they made arrangements for Ed to go to the FBI office in Dallas and uh, tell the story. Well, either the FBI, and I, I don't know who to blame, but they knew, 
they took the appointment that they were going to be talking to a deaf person, but they had nobody there to interpret. So Ed had to basically draw what he remembered, how the plaza was laid out and where he was, and basically told the story to Udo Speck, the first FBI agent he, he spoke to. We know that Udo Speck wrote a report, but we can't find that report anywhere in the archives. According to what Ed said, Agent Speck and him went out to Dealey Plaza, and the FBI agent took color slides of the area. And we've never seen those pictures ever. It didn't go anywhere. I mean, in the House Senate Committee on Assassinations in 1976, nobody ever mentioned Ed Hoffman. Nobody ever said, well, let's see what his story is or never called him to testify. And he was still alive and nobody ever did anything. So it tells me that the FBI either dropped the ball on purpose or it was just thought of it's, you know, another another kooky witness came forward. And so we'll just put it in the kooky file. So. But Ed, Ed was frustrated. I mean, he, you could tell his frustration because he never read the Warren report. He never won, read the 26 volumes. He didn't want to have waste time on that. He knows what he saw, and that's all he could, all he would ever be able to testify to. The facts that he saw, the things that he saw, the observations that he made behind the picket fence were all verified. And in our book, we, we went through that meticulously to verify, did he see a police officer confront somebody? Did this Rambo station wagon, was it seen anywhere else? Could somebody have been standing by the railroad switch box? All those facts checked out. Was there somebody in the follow-up car with the rifle? Yes, that was Agent George Hickey with the Secret Service. He had an AR-15 in the follow-up car. He wrote a report that he took it out as they passed through Dealey Plaza. Ed said that it was a police officer on top of the railroad trestle over Stemmons Freeway. We got the Dallas Police Parade documents that the chief of police put together for the Warren Commission. It shows police officer Earl Brown was stationed on top of the railroad trestle. Now, how would Ed Hoffman know any of those things if he wasn't there, I mean, he he could not have just guessed that that was going to be there. He talked about the puff of smoke. There was Sam Holland. Sam Holland was one of the 18 men on top of the triple overpass. He said, we all saw the smoke drift out from the fence. How did Ed Hoffman see smoke? He didn't know Sam Holland or any of those workers on top of the railroad overpass. So he probably saw the same thing they did. How did he know there was a police officer on top of the triple overpass? There were two officers stationed there, Officer Foster and Officer White. They were on top of the overpass. Ed said that the officer on the triple overpass was standing behind the men on the overpass. And he said the guy, the officer had a white hat and he was taller than everybody else. Well, the reason he was taller is he's standing on a railroad little switch box and he had a white hat because he's, Officer Foster was assigned to the traffic unit. So all those things support Ed's story that he was there. And as an investigator, we all think that we know how to investigate, but I did it for a living. And you take all the information that a, that a witness will give you and you corroborate it independently. Everything he said was true. You know, his story makes sense. Personally, I think he's the most credible witness I've ever talked to in this case. After you've investigated him, and you found it, what he has said. What are the conclusions that you have about the crime scene? What you know? What are some of the uh, observations and conclusions that you're going to make about this? Well, I think there was somebody shooting from behind the fence. If I was going to do it from a tactical standpoint, I would put somebody there, put him in a uniform or something that would look like he belongs there. The Rambler wagon that Ed saw pull into the parking lot, that was seen by five other witnesses. I think that might have been a getaway car, the man who fired the rifle. But then to avoid holding evidence, he got rid of it. And so now you have a security guy, kind of a helper, standing by the railroad switch box, you know, your cleanup guy. He's the guy that gets rid of the evidence. Tactically, it looks like it would all fit. You know, this is not something that was thought up overnight. This was a well-planned, well-executed assassination. So you had to have, you know, contingency plans. I don't think that the man who carried the rifle and threw it to the man in the coveralls was expecting to be observed. But when he had somebody got the drop on him, basically, he had something to show. I'm really supposed to be here. It's okay. I'm the security guy. 
Well, Joe Marshall Smith, the officer that confronted this man, when he testified to the Warren Commission, he said, there was a guy back there when I got there, he was in suit. He had credentials that said he was Secret Service. He says, unfortunately, I didn't get his name, but he says he appeared to be okay to me. And then he walked off looking for other witnesses. Well, that goes exactly what Ed said. He said the guy pointed a gun at him, he showed him something, and he walked away. So you've got backup as far as, you know, what do I do if I get caught? Here's what I do. I don't have any weapons with me. Nobody's going to suspect me. You know, people have always asked us whenever we do a lecture, well, how come all those people are running up there? What's the, the government's contention was that they were getting out of the line of fire. Well, that that's ludicrous. You wouldn't run at a 90-degree angle to the shooter. You would run away from the shooter. But all these people are running up the hill because that's where the sounds came from. They thought, maybe we'll get the guy. Now, you got to remember this Texas mentality. I mean, you know, hey, there's a guy, there's a bad guy up there. Let's all go. In fact, one of the witnesses that we talked to and grew to be pretty good friends with was Malcolm Summers. He was standing on the south side of the Elm Street and real close to United Press photographer James Alkins. And he says after the shots were fired, he's, and you can see it in the Zach Ruder film where Malcolm is down on the ground on, on his backside. He said the shots sounded like it came from across the street. He says, I didn't know which way to go, if I was in the line of fire or not. And he said, then I saw all those people running. He says, I got up and ran across the street with him. And he said, by the time he got to the second set of steps, the landing up there, he said there was a man that came out from behind the fence. There was a police officer up there, a uniformed police officer, and a guy with a raincoat over his arm and a white Stetson hat. And he thought, well, maybe that must be a cop. And Malcolm told us on more than one occasion, he said, when he got to the top of those steps and he saw that guy coming out from behind the fence, he said, I could see the barrel of a handgun underneath this raincoat that he had over his arm. And he said, the guy said to everybody in the area or was coming up the steps, he says, y'all don't want to come up here. You could all get shot. Now that guy's never been identified and no officer of the Dallas police or the Dallas sheriff or the secret service or the FBI was on the ground that quickly. So whoever it was, was armed and had the appearance of maybe a Dallas detective, a Dallas homicide detective, but nobody was there except civilians. So whoever that guy was, you know, that's part of the team. You confuse everybody. Nobody knows who the bad guy is. And cops show up. They don't know who they're looking for. They're looking for a guy with a rifle. Well, this guy's got no rifle. Maybe he showed him identification or something. I don't know. You know, Len, over the years, what we've tried to do is, is try to piecemeal a lot of these scenarios together. And once you start to piecemeal this together, you wonder why the Dallas police or the FBI or some authorities did not do this to come up with a virtual very good scenario that there was other people shooting in the plaza. Because you have over 80 eyewitnesses that saw some of the very same things that our witness, Ed Hoffman, saw, but they saw from, from a different point of view. And when you start piecemealing all this together, you do have a scenario, a realistic scenario put together by all these eyewitnesses that there were shooters in the front and right front of President Kennedy. And I don't know why, other than the fact that the Dallas police basically, along with the FBI, felt like they had their man, and two days later, he's dead. So case closed. Uh, this is not closed. It's wide open. We're still looking at hard evidence. We're still looking at the scenarios that people are starting to come forward even now, and even deathbed confessions saying, you know, uh, Len, uh, people like uh, Gerald Posner have really just cut the heck out of Ed Hoffman. And for no apparent reason at all, none of them ever talked to him. You know, you want to talk about fake news and, and false information. They're the ones that are putting out false news and fake information. Ed Hoffman uh, is probably the most mild-mannered, unassuming, sincere person that I ever knew. And he just was excited that we were excited about writing this story. I mean, the guy was like a little boy that somebody believed him finally and was glad that his story was out there. He didn't care if anybody believed him. He knew what he saw. His family knew what he saw. We knew what he saw. Ed said that dad told him it was a Secret Service agent protecting the president. He said, no matter what you saw, that's who you saw in the car was the Secret Service. And that was a good guy. 
the reason I think that nobody in the family wanted Ed to tell the story is because he, they were afraid for him for his life. But it, what's interesting is that his dad got so mad because he, you know, it was after Thanksgiving and, and he had gone to the FBI again when he found out about it. His, his father was just livid because the agent called Ed's father and said, Hey, your son just came from our office. Did you know this story? And so Ed's father was absolutely beside himself because he had told him, don't tell anybody because something might happen to you. But then he turns around and goes to the FBI because of his conscience or he just wanted to unburden himself. Ed was 26 years old at the time. Uh, Understand that the deaf community is really a, a tight community, but it's also tight with individuals who can actually speak the American Sign Language. And Ed didn't really speak American Sign Language. He had the old sign language. So for the ASL people to try to do the interpretation, it was kind of hard to interpret the old sign language with the new sign language. So that's why you have a lot of misinterpretation in, in translation. But at the same time, Ed was 26 years old, and he is by far a very intelligent man, relied heavily on his father because his father could talk to him and could sign and could write things down, and Ed could write things down. Linda, you mentioned The Men Who Killed Kennedy, that five-part series that Nigel Turner did. That was excellent. There, little, there is a sequence about Ed in there. And unfortunately, even the uh, interpreter, the voiceover of Ed telling the story is incorrect. And that's why some of the people jump on that and go, well, he told Nigel Turner this, and then now you're saying he did this. Well, what I did, what Casey and I did, was we took that segment of Nigel Turner's sequence on Ed, turned the volume off, and had a level 5-5 five, five court-certified interpreter of American Sign Language. And he watched the video, noted what he said, and then we turned the sound back up, watched the segment again, and he stopped it every time the guy got the the interpreter, the voiceover interpreter got the information wrong. He said, well, that's not what he's signing. He's signing, he walked rapidly. Well, the the voiceover in one sequence said, walked slowly, casually, talking about the man who had the rifle. That's not what Ed is signing, and that's not what he told us. He said he sprinted, ran rapidly. Well, the interpreter was wrong. When Jim Mars uh, interviewed Ed in Dealey Plaza, he didn't have a certified level three or four or five interpreter. He had some kid taking the college course on American Sign Language, and he was the interpreter, and he got the information wrong. He described the men he saw with the rifle wearing a sport coat, not a top coat. Well, the interpreter said it was a top coat, like a raincoat. Well, that's not correct. You know, just those little things that would make somebody who could speak very clear, but somebody who couldn't speak, it's open for interpretation by the person who's watching him. So that was one of the critiques that we wanted to clear up was that Ed said this on this program, and it was not correct because the interpreter got it wrong. It's not that Ed is changing the story. It's the interpretation was invalid and properly tamed. And that's why... We went through his daughter, Mary Hoffman. She was a level four interpreter so that she could speak to her parents. We relied on her for everything that we came from Ed. We asked Mary the question, and she said, I understand what the question is. We'd write it down. She would interpret to Ed, her father. Ed would respond. Mary would interpret it and tell it to us. We spent one or two days just asking Ed questions like he was on the witness stand. We actually took Ed down to the picket fence and redid the thing with him over there. You said the guy pulled the rifle down off the fence. Yes. And then what did he do? Well, he sprinted. And so I said, stop right here. I said, he sprinted. Can you show us what it is? He goes, well, I'm an old man. I can't run that fast. I said, well, I'm a little bit younger. I said, Brian, time me. And then you tell Ed that I'm going to run down the fence line. And of course, we had a rifle with us. We had a 6.5 rifle with us, and I ran down the fence line about five seconds. Now, that was in my younger days. But five seconds to get down to that and dump that rifle off, and Ed turns around and he goes, yes, that's what happened. That's what I saw. We were down there one of those weekends where uh, 
uh, Dr. Robert McClellan came in. He looked at us and he says, so you guys are the guys that wrote the book on Ed Hoffman? And we said, yes. And we gave him a copy and he goes, God, he says, he says, I believe this guy 100% because basically everything that he has said is what I have seen on the operating table of President Kennedy. And he says, is there any way that we could meet Ed Hoffman? And I looked at Brian and I said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, here's one of the most uh, renowned doctors in Dallas, has never met Ed Hoffman, and you should have seen that. Ed Hoffman meets Robert McClellan for the very first time. I mean, it's, it's a history among itself right there. It was an eye-opening thing to see both of these guys hug each other and, and know that they had seen the very same thing on November 22nd that they had said they'd seen, and nobody wanted to believe them at the federal, the state, and the local levels. Now, a little while ago, you mentioned the sixth floor and taking your students there. Brian and I were, both went down there when uh, Clint Hill was speaking, and when we got down there, I saw Dr. McClellan, whom we've been associated with quite a bit, and so I, I grabbed a hold of McClellan, and so we got right up in front, and the reason we wanted to do that, when I asked Dr. McClellan, I said, would you like to sit right in front of Clint Hill? And I said, I'll, I'll introduce you to Clint Hill, and I said, I don't even know Clint Hill. So as we're sitting down, I said, uh, Mr. Hill, I said, this is Dr. McClellan who operated and worked on President Kennedy. He looked at him, and all I was trying to do, and I think what Dr. McClellan was there for, is to hopefully get a true synopsis of what Hill was going to say about what he saw the president. And at that time, guess what he said? He said, the back of his head was blown out. And he said it right in front of Dr. McClellan. And I sat back and I go, my God, everywhere else he said the right front of his head was blown out. But right there, Hill started to shed a little tear, and he says the back of his head was blown out. But, you know, Clint Hill has continued to say that the the back of the head was not blown out. It was on the right side over the top of the ear. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he said that, I think, because he saw Dr. McClellan, he knew he would have been called a liar in front of 300 people. So I think he basically turned his cheek and said, okay, this is what I saw. But the official record in my testimony, the Warren Commission, and my subsequent book on everything after that is that the right side of the head was blown out. So our motivation was to tell Ed's story before it got forgotten and before people would think, well, where'd this guy, how come this guy didn't show up the day of? Well, he did. He tried to tell somebody and, and nobody ever followed up on it. Uh, it's a shame that he's now deceased and had never got to... Uh... Uh, present anything before any type of committee, but uh, we will try to keep his memory and the book going as long as we are still alive. So, saying that, where is your book available? Amazon.com. Type in Beyond the Fence Line. You can also get online to uh, JFKLancer.com and uh, order those books online there also. All right, Casey and Brian, thanks so much then for being a guest on Black Op Radio. Thanks.